Welcome everyone. You've uh, tuned in for another edition of our Thursday afternoon winemaker seminar and tasting. Um, we've been doing these for a number of weeks now since we've been in shelter in place and uh, uh, we're enjoying the opportunity to share uh, a number of our different wines with you here every Thursday. Um, today, this particular seminar is gonna focus on some of our Rhone varietal wines specifically our Litton Estate Syrah, as well as our Bucagnani Ranch Carignan. So we've picked uh, uh, a couple of vintages of both of these wines to taste today and talk about. Um, before we get going, uh, I do want to do a little shout out for a couple of our good customers who are having uh, birthdays today. So uh, uh, Frank Sato in Georgia, happy birthday to you. And uh, happy birthday also to Amy Brady. So again, raise your glass and uh, yeah. enjoy your birthday uh, celebration with a little more wine. Uh, <clears throat> so I think uh, what I'd like to do next is introduce our panelists for the day today. Uh, we'll start uh, with uh, Eric Baher, who's a chief Hi. operating officer and head winemaker at our Montebello facility in the hills above Cupertino. Uh, next, we have John Olney, who's our Chief Operating Officer and Head Winemaker for the winery at Lytton Springs in he Healdsburg, Sonoma County, as well as uh, David Gates, who's our Senior Vice President of Vineyard Operations and does everything that has to do with vineyards and growing our wonderful grapes. So say hi, Dave. Hi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So with that, um, I'd like to just give you a little update on Ridge. Fortunately, we all continue to be healthy. Uh, <clears throat> nobody's sick. The wineries are operating. The vineyards are being tended. Um, our tasting rooms continue to be closed, although we are offering a pickup service for those customers in the local area who would like to drive by and make an appointment. They can come over and pick up wine at our Litton Springs tasting room. And we've started a pickup service at our offices in the city of Saratoga. So you can also pick up wine there. Uh, in addition, we've created a delivery service for the South Bay area. So that's another way you can get your wine uh, from Ridge. Um, on top of that, uh, we uh, continue to make wine available through our website. And in fact, all four of the wines that we're gonna be talking about here today are available for purchase on the internet through our website. Um, these four wines are all, have all been created for our uh, ATP, Advanced Tasting Program Wine Club. And so if you've never had them before or you're interested in receiving them on an ongoing basis, I encourage you to consider signing up for our ATP uh, wine program. We uh, think it's one of the oldest wine clubs in existence. It started back in the 1970s. We've sort of challenged uh, the rest of the industry to tell us about a wine club that a winery had started before that. We haven't found one yet. So it's really the, the original uh, opportunity to get wines directly from a winery. And in our case, these are special productions from special vineyards, usually smaller quantities, uh, not enough that we can sell them in the broader general market. So they're your chance to get uh, uh, and taste and enjoy some really special wines. So Having said that, I think I'm going to turn it over uh, to Eric and let him tell yeah. us about the Syrah. Syrah, yeah. You know, we've been fortunate to be working with these vines since 96 when uh, that was when we bought the Norton Ranch, the, what is part of the Litton West property today. And that was our first year of working with uh, Syrah, bringing it down to Montebello. And we just, you know, of course, we love the wines of the Northern Rhone Valley. And you know, it was really fun to begin working with it in that time. Um, 96 was kind of the first trial year trying to figure out how to ferment it. And we kind of treated it that year more like Zinfandel. So doing kind of de-stem, full crush, co-ferment with Viognier to kind of help with the, the softening of tannins. You know, but we went into these tanks and really worked the skins. And in the 96 vintage, we really made this big, seriously tannic, wine. So 97 then was a vintage that I, I tried more of the Bordeaux techniques, the pole berry, you know, much more delicate extraction. And that really was the magical uh, difference of, of 
really bringing the Syrah around to be in a much more sensuous, balanced wine with good depth of color. I mean, we weren't sacrificing ageability. It's just we were making a much more immediately delicious drinking Syrah with the more elegant approach of extraction that we apply to making Montebello Cabernet. And so we've kind of stayed with those techniques all these years. I mean, we've continued to improve upon the handling of, of the, the grapes as they come into the winery, the sorting um, ability that we can do here. And also using small fermenters, you get better extraction that way. So by 15, I mean, we really had those techniques dialed in. Uh, 15, we, we put in 7% uh, Viognier. So the amount of Viognier that we add at Crush can vary depending on how careful David and his picking teams are with, you know, picking off the Viognier and throwing it into the bin. Uh, but 7%, kind of 12 to 7 is, is generally where we lie with the amount of Viognier. If you go a little bit beyond 12, the Viognier is such a dominant grape, it can actually start to overtake some of the Syrah characteristics. So I, I tend to like to stay within that narrow band between 10 and 7. Um, and in 15, it just worked out beautiful. It was a very concentrated vintage uh, being a drought year. You know, we didn't have much yield. So that and the water stress on the vines really created great concentration in the grapes. And it just produced a beautiful Syrah. I mean, really deep uh, blue fruit, lots of fennel and, and all the exotic spice that you get from Syrah. Now, one thing that I've learned over, over time working with Syrah is that it's really ideal to let it rest in barrel for a long time. So we really push, that's probably one of the most barrel aged wines we make at Ridge. You know, the cabs tend to go 18 to 24 months. The Syrah goes out to even about 27, 28 months of just letting it rest in barrel We'll still rack for clarity, but, but we're really trying to work that wine along to really shed enough tannin so that it hits the bottle in, in a really nice round, supple way with the tannins being integrated. And then on top of it, because this wine is sold right here at the winery through ATP, we can just sit on it in the warehouse and we'll do our tastings periodically as we're assessing the wines and how they're aging in bottle then we'll release it to uh, sell so that it's really in, a, in the perfect drinking moment. And so the 15 we just released recently and it's drinking extremely well right now. You know, it's got the beautiful fruit. It's a young Syrah, but it's also got tannins that are so perfectly woven in with that dark fruit. And, and it is on the riper side, I mean, you know, the, Harvest of Syrah can kind of bounce around. I mean, a lot of it, we're, we're kind of vulnerable to weather and what's going on in the days of harvest. So if we get blasted by heat, you know, the Syrah can sometimes hit that 15% alcohol. But, you know, we've made beautiful Syrahs at 13.8, you know, 14.1. You know, that's, that's where we tend to try to come in. So it all comes down to does Mother Nature work with us and are the weather conditions, you know, allowing us to, to kind of cruise into harvest with grapes that haven't over ripened. But so it's Eric, a beautiful Syrah. So Eric, we, this uh, 2015 Syrah is the, uh, the 20th vintage of Syrah that uh, uh, we've made. And over the course of those different, those 20 years, uh, tell us a little bit about Again, what you, you started to talk about what you've learned from the vineyard and, and, and the Yeah. I mean we're, we're Yeah, so we're fortunate. I mean the the block when we bought the ranch, they had planted really one of the best clones, the Syrah Noir, the old I mean David can tell us more about Syrah Noir and but it, it is just this really beautiful clone of Syrah with these oblong berries that are small and just loaded with color and flavor and good acidity. And the spot where we're growing it at the top of basically right next to East Bench on the, the bench overlooking Dry Creek, it's got just a, a really cool microclimate there that, that really helps it ripen and hold its acids. So generally, Syrah is notoriously um, low acid. And, and what I love about the location we're at in Lytton West and with that clone, the Syrah Noir, is that it will ripen. It actually 
defies that that rule and it r ripens and holds its acid very well. So I generally don't have to even think about tartaric acid additions. And in this vintage, well, unfortunately 15 with it being warm like that, I, on the ingredient line, you can actually see that, that some tartaric was added at crush. But some years I don't have to even think about it. And so, you know, yeah, it, it is a really cool spot for growing Syrah. And, um, and I guess the other thing that I've learned with Syrah is that it, it is also known to be kind of a reductive grape. So in the fermenter, it sometimes will put out some uh, sulfides, you know, H, H2S, and, and it can get a little, a little funky and odorous. And, you know, so, so, you know, what we do to combat that in the winery is, is during the pump overs, we do aerated pump overs. So we're splashing the juice, bringing oxygen to the yeast, and that helps kind of pass it off so that it doesn't stay fixed in the wine. So when we go to barrel, then it, it's, it's really wine that has really good fruit definition. And then the other thing that I, I've done is kind of the Montebello-like uh, barrel malolactics, putting the wine to barrel, letting the natural malolactics finish in barrel, letting it rest on its leaf for a good six months. And that also helps incorporate more complexity and richness and texture into the wine. So the wine has definitely evolved over the 20 years. You know, there was also a period of time when the Viognier went away. We, when we bought the ranch, there was a, the Viognier vines had AXR rootstock and, and phylloxera, and we eventually had to rip that out. And so there was about, from 98 to about 2002, there was no Viognier to use. So we kind of struggled with what to add to the Syrah to kind of help temper the tannins. And we played around a bit with some Grenache, a little bit of Carignan, I know in the 2002 vintage, we did two different blends of Syrah, Syrah 1, Syrah 2. They were different blends of, of proportions of how much Carignan, how much Grenache. And uh, by three, 2003, we kind of came back with the new plantings of the Onion. So we were able to bring, it, bring in, uh, uh, let's see, 9% 9, 9 of the Onion in the 2003. So we kind of got it back to the style we want, wanted to produce. And, and um, that's kind of where we've been now with Syrah since 2003. It's been in that range of, of uh, you know, anywhere between 5 and 12% Viognier, but only Viognier. Because really, you know, in the end, as beautiful as Carignan is in a blend, it, it's better when it's on its own, like the Bucanyani you'll, you'll taste. I mean or with Zinfandel, but with Syrah, it didn't really quite work. Uh, same with Grenache. I mean, it's kind of two fighting varieties in a blend. And that's why we kind of played around with it and experimented with, with those two different blends in 2002. But ultimately, and what's been determined in the Northern Rome Valley for centuries is that Viognier is really the most ideal blending grape to co-ferment with Syrah. And that's where we are today with it. Mm. And we're using American oak. So, you know, I have played around with a little bit of French. I even tried, um, oh gosh, it was, it was a long time ago, some Spanish barrels. I mean, American oak barrels, American oak shipped over to Spain, sent back over for me to play around with. And, you know, I, I love what the American oak does, but really in the end, the best American oak barrels are those that are made right here domestically, you know, from Kentucky and from the Ozarks. And that's what we're using mostly in our Syrah. And that goes back to even the beginning in 96. That's really the oak we relied upon. We weren't sending it to French oak. Uh, as beautiful as French oak can be, I just think, you know, we're, we're trying to make Syrah in the ridge style. And part of that is, you know, giving that imprint of, of the American oak in a way where it integrates into the wine. So Eric, one question we're getting is, uh, uh, and by the way, for those of you who are watching today on Zoom, if you have a question for any of the panelists, if you could use the Q&A function on Zoom, that would be great. Uh, the chat is good, but there's a lot of things going on on the chat. And so if you specifically have a question, please put that on the Q&A 
uh, queue on Zoom. And one of the questions is using whole cluster. Tell us about that. Oh, so, so I did whole cluster one year. That was 98. That was because I didn't have anything to blend or co-ferment with the uh, Syrah, 98. That's when we set up the chute. We went from the crush pad down into the winery, sending the clusters down the chute into the fermenter. And we did that. And it was an interesting flavor. I mean, the thing with whole cluster, you got to be careful about stem ripeness. If the stems are really green, then you're going to be leaching out green flavors, green tannins. And unfortunately, 98, that was kind of what we saw. I mean, it, it wasn't something that really, um, something I wanted to stay with in the future with, with, with the Syrah, because it really marked the wine in an herbaceousness. It gave it a, a really strong kind of green character. So I think that's important to talk about the difference between whole cluster and whole berry, right? Yeah, so whole berry is where you're just, you're separating the stem, the stem is discarded, the berry runs through the destemmer crusher without being broken open. So you're collecting nice whole berries in the fermenter where it's just containing the seed and you've got the pulp surrounding the, the seed. So it's a method in which we can control the tannin extraction. Something that's really crucial to do with Montebello fruit because we're dealing with a lot of tannin here with Cabernet. So Syrah is also really tannic grape. And so it's nice to contain the tannin. And with every pump over you give, you taste, you can see some of the tannin coming out, but you can really moderate it. When you break the berries open and crush it like we do with Zinfandels, you, you're releasing the seed. The seed's in contact 24 hours a day with the fermenting juice it's leaching out, you can't control it, you can't hold it back, it's going to extract and you're gonna end up over extracting. But with Zinfandel being a less tannic grape, that's actually desirable. You want, that's how we can build structure into our Zinfandel. But with Syrah, it would just make a Syrah that would just be so undrinkable. You'd have to wait decades before it's ready to drink. So, uh, so Dave Gates, maybe you can tell us a little bit about farming Syrah and the Syrah at Lytton West. And, you know, Eric has talked about this, this great old clone <laughs> of Syrah, Syrah Noir that we inherited with the ranch. And we've tried a few other clones, but not have, not have liked them as much as that one that was there from the beginning. So talk about that, Dave. Sure. There, there are, um, there's, uh, several several Syrah, Syrah selections that, that came into California, mostly by uh, through uh, UC Davis and Dr. Harold Omo. He brought the first ones in in the late 30s and then uh, continued through the, I believe, the 60s when he brought the last of them. And there are four or five that are that are in the uh, increase blocks um, and available to the university. One of those is Syrah Noir. Um, don't really know which one. I think mm. it's the, the one that they call Espigay. So he, he labeled them um, di differently. Um, and there was one actually that he labeled as, he wasn't sure what it was. And it turns out that it was Syrah. So it was labeled in the, in the old, this is you know, way before Foundation Plant Services. And, and it was labeled in the old uh, Foundation Vineyard as not Syrah, but it, <laughs> indeed it was Syrah. So that's one of that's in the mix too. So, um, but we've also uh, worked a bit with some of the newer Ancov selections from France. And while they are nice, they're they don't seem they're not they don't have that that the quality the same kind of quality as Syrah Noir. And and mostly it's because not only are they a little bit younger vines, of course, but the, they have big clusters. So you really have to um, do some heavy thinning on them. And if you don't do that, you, you lack a little bit of intensity. Mm -hmm. And Syrah is, um, is fun to grow and challenging to grow. So it's, um, you basically, it's kind of like um, Jekyll and Hyde. You spend the first half of the season with your foot on the brake because it just wants to grow. It, it, um, it sees water, it grows. Um, and it will grow itself right out of, it'll, it'll use up all the water in the soil and then crash. So then the, so the first half of the season, foot on the brake, trying to contain the vigor, it's a strong grower. The second half of the season, it's, it's foot on the gas, trying to make sure that the leaves stay on that, and it will dehydrate very easily. So um, we do get irrigated occasionally. Um, 15, we irrigated it more than occasionally because it was a very dry year. 
and um, and that that really helps it so that it doesn't get ripe too ripe too fast. And the the other really important thing is, in my opinion, is the co-ferment with Viognier because the straw on its own at, at at Dry Creek Valley in Lytton Springs can be a little monolithic, and uh, Viognier really helps to lift lift the nose and softens the tannins. It 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 adds to the finish actually. And it actually increases the color through uh, co mm -hmm. from the co pigmentation. Yeah, yeah. The co pigmentation is the coolest thing about the Viognier edition. Is on its own, you know, the Syrah has got a lot of color, but it, it's unstable color, and it really needs to latch on to some compounds to stabilize. And that's what Viognier has in it in the skins is these phenolic compounds that that are tannin like that latch on and and really just keep the, the Syrah anthocyanin pigment in a, stable, you know, in a stable solution so that it, it doesn't precipitate out. And you know, and I remember back, this was 19, it was either 96 or 97 when um, we had a big um, conference, the OIV conference came to California and we were showing them around and um, we were in the process, we just, purchased Lytton Estate West, and there are a lot of varieties of grapes on it, <clears throat> including, uh, well, too many to list actually, but um, then this one block of Syrah planted in, uh, I think it was planted in 80, 87, um, which was up in, and um, up on the bench there, and uh, we actually um, tasted that wine, and we didn't make the wine that, that um, we were tasting with the OIV, uh, Fred Peterson, made it. He had bought the grapes from Bill Hambrick um, the year before, then, and it was the 95 that we were tasting. And I remember um, Gerard Shav uh, looking at that, tasting it, and, and he, he sniffed it, and he looked at Paul. And then he tasted it, and he looked at Paul and said, you should do something with this. And that, so we decided that we would um, keep the Syrah and get rid of the Barbera and uh, <laughs> yeah, the Sangiovese, Sangiovese. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> the, and the Merlot and the Cabernet and this in it's et cetera et cetera but the Syrah State and and um and it, it's really it's fun fun to work with it yeah and I think we really I mean as those vines have matured now I mean they just have gotten better I mean the yields aren't usually out of control I mean the vigor is there in the springtime as you as Dave was, was mentioning it's in the most wind whipped spot on the vineyard too. And that's the biggest problem with Syrah is that it's so leggy. And so the wind rips through and can end up with a lot of shoots ripped off by the wind. But, you know, the fruit's protected. You've got wires there. So it's one of the few blocks over at Lytton West that's up on trellis system to help kind of give, give the vine some structure to hold on to. So, uh, so Eric, I think one of the things that we're, we've, we've seen also with the Syrah uh, over these years is that uh, the wines that we've been making uh, from Lytton West are aging beautifully. I think uh, yeah. you know, there's just no question that uh, these Syrahs are wines that, while they can give you a lot of pleasure in their youth, um, mm -hmm. they clearly have an ability to age out over quite a long period of time and, and really... Uh, provide a lot of interest and pleasure over that over that aging period. So let's yeah. with that transition into the second one. Oh yeah, I mean this 2003 is a great example of the ageability, and it, it it still is young. I mean that's the amazing thing. I, I still have bottles of 96 and 97 in my cellar. I think I even still have almost a full case of 98 because I I knew that was a really tannic wine, so I was like, uh, just give it give it time, be patient with it. Um, but the 2003 was a great growing season. I mean, also dry, very hot. It was, um, well, you know, the year in, in Europe where it was just these blasting heat waves through summer and August, and, and it really kicked up ripeness for a lot of the producers in the Rhone Valley. I actually made a quick trip out there because I thought our, our harvest was going to start late. So I went and spent a week in the south of France and it was blazing hot. And then I came back here expecting, oh, I'd have plenty of time before harvest started and no luck. I mean, it started right away. We were getting blasts of heat right in the middle of September, but it, it really, that kind of late season heat really has, especially for Syrah, and we see it with Montebello fruit is when it's kind of 
kind of tempered, moderate summer weather where it's relatively cool and you're inching out towards harvest and then you get heat at the end of the season really has a, a huge effect on the fruit character of the vintage. You know, drives it towards dark berry, you know, in the case of Syrah, more like blueberry. So it was really, as a young wine, it was really opulent, you know, with lots of really weighty tannins and, you know, lots of flesh and, and richness. And as it's aged, I mean, you still smell just this intense fruit on the nose. Yeah, it's, it's gorgeous to raw. I mean, it's a really um, still a wine I, I could see aging for at least another 20 years. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just on that plateau where it's it's climbed to that point where it's got some really beautiful secondary fruit developing. But on the palate, it's still very fleshy and masculine and gamey and all those really wonderful flavors of Syrah, you know, where, you know, Syrah has got, got this really kind of gamey, meaty, uh, it's almost venison-like, um, or when it's young, really young, in the fermenter especially, you can almost, it's almost like uh, Italian sausage, uh, that sausage and fennel. And as it ages out, it still kind of holds on to that kind of that character but then with really spicy and rich tannins. Mm. Yeah, this is beautiful. And I know we, we did a tasting earlier this year here at the winery when we pulled out a bunch of the old reserves and was tasting through. And we even had a bottle of 2000, which was just also just absolutely impressive and beautiful. And that was in that, Kind of period of time when we didn't have the Viognier, but yet it really is still still showing so well. So, yeah, I think I think we have really got a very special piece of ground in that vineyard, and with the the old clones. Now, 2003 includes some of the the younger plantings that we brought in, so some of those on top clones, you know, with the bigger, juicier berries. Three worked out where you know we got good concentration in those grapes. And uh, the prior vintages, when they were younger, you know, we, we had to do a lot of declassification on some of those blocks. You know, it wasn't immediately that those young parcels worked out to inc be included in their Syrah bottling. But in three, you know, we, you know, the nature of the growing season and that heat at the end really induced some beautiful flavor and intensity. Fantastic. So um, David Gates, we're getting a number of questions about um, the, the comparison and relationship between Syrah and Petite Syrah. Oh, and, yeah. And, and understanding, maybe you could tell us a little bit of that history and the relationship between the two grapes. And uh, because, you know, it's interesting, we grow a lot of Petite Syrah at Lytton, uh, at Lytton as well. And it's a grape that also seems to do very well at, at the Lytton property. So tell us about those two grapes and compare them. Sure. Uh, Petite Syrah is an offspring. It's a, a, a cross of uh, Syrah and a, and a little obscure grape called Peller Sand. If you look in old Petite Syrah vineyards um, it, through California there, you will often find, um, you know, quite a few Peller Sand vines and a few Syrah vines in them. Um, there's a fellow named uh, Professor Dereef, who in the mid 1880s uh, was making uh, crosses and decided to uh, purposefully cross Syrah and Pellersan and, and came up with what we call Cal in California Petit Syrah. He, of course, named it Dereef. So it's actually, its official name is, is Dereef, D-U-R-I-F. Um, they really, California probably grows the most of it. There's a little, you'll find a little bit of it in Australia and they call it Dereef down there. Um, almost everybody in California calls it Petit Syrah, this uh, grape. In, um, and you'll find it in a few other places in the world, maybe Chile. Um, it's really not grown in France anymore. Pellersan, likewise, um, it's very obscure and never had very many plants um, grown in the ground in the south of France. And, and it, likewise, it doesn't. And, in California either. If you, if you taste, so you're tasting the Syrah, so you, the tannins are evident, but they're sweet tannins. Mm -hmm. 
and it's got a pretty good color. If you if you um, happen to bite into a pelarsan berry at when it's close to harvest, the, yeah. it's so bitter that you you just you don't. <laughs> it's it's really bad, nasty tannins on the skins. And so if, and then if you bite into a peach syrah a berry when it's ripe, it has the, it has the color of syrah and it's got a lot. It, the tannins are much more aggressive than syrah tannins. Um, and and so it's kind of this perfect example of taking something with very, Syrah, a parent with very sweet tannins and, a, and another parent with very aggressive tannins, you get something that is a little stouter than Syrah and will age, um, age nicely too. Yeah, we probably have the longest history working with Petite Syrah. I mean, Paul made the first Petite Syrah at Ridge from York Creek Vineyard and let's say 71 vintage. And uh, yeah, you still can drink the wine. When it was young, it was probably really tannic, but it, it's, it's almost Cabernet like, and that's, that's, I mean, P Petite Syrah is a beautiful variety. And, and that daughter. vineyard, that, and that old vineyard at, at York Creek that since uh, succumbed to Pearson disease, that was one of those mixed vineyards. So it had, mm, it was probably 98% or, or so Petite Syrah, but there were um, Syrah and Pellerson vines. In there. Yeah. Well, I'm drinking our Syrah in the PS I love you glass that I got. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the association supporting Petit Zura, you know. <laughs> well, if we're doing and it's, acronyms, it's tasting re and it's yeah. tasting really good. Yeah, if we're Dave, doing we're... acronyms. My uh, my water glass is Rhone Ranger, so big. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, excellent, um, Eric. Thank you so much for sharing all this. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Knowledge and wisdom and experience with the Zura. Um, you know, we had a few questions about the fact that, well, why are we making this wine at Montebello? But it's, you have to understand that um, when, we, when we bought the property at Lytton Springs uh, back in the mid 90s, there really wasn't much of a winery there. Um, it was kind of a, a small facility that had been built just to produce a small amount of Zinfandel. So in the early days, we basically were bringing almost all of the fruit from Lit Springs down to Montebello in order to make the wines. And over time, as we built the new winery at Lytton, we transitioned mm -hmm. quite a few of the wines up there. But because of our total capacity and also the timing of when grapes come ripe, we found that it's, it's a good thing to keep a, a, few of the, a few of the wines and a few of the grapes and the wines coming down to Montebello so that um, they can get good attention while others are also being harvested at the same time and can go to Lytton Springs and uh, be worked on with John. So yeah. I think it's a, a system that has served us well uh, to be able to handle uh, very busy harvests and give each of the winemakers an opportunity to work with uh, uh, grapes that may be coming ripe at the same time and not get overwhelmed, so. Yeah. And the other, I mean, treating this more like Bordeaux also, I mean, you know, we've kind of got the Bordeaux configuration at Montebello Winery. Yeah. And John also is making some delicious Syrah, but it's blended with the Grenache and the Matara. And then we, we had one just recently in one of our tastings. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're beautiful wines. I mean, yeah, absolutely. So it's and that wine there being more blended, I mean, it that actually works out really well to be made in a, a, a setup that's more Zinfandel configured. Yeah. Yeah, so let's, with that, I think that's a good way to transition yeah. over. We're going to uh, bring John into the discussion. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to point out that uh, John is coming from a different location this time. Um, he abandoned me here at the Lytton Springs Winery, and uh, I think he's in his kitchen right now. Um, <laughs> maybe before you get going, John, you could just, just to quickly, a couple, uh, just talk about the, uh, the other Rhone wines that you're making, just to put this in context so everyone's aware of those, and then we can zero in on the, the, the Bucignan and Carignan. Sure, uh, so we're, uh, <clears throat> we have some other uh, blocks planted around uh, Lytton West where we have uh, some Syrah and uh, Grenache and Mataro, so we, and we blend that uh, since I think 2014 to make a Syrah Grenache Mataro. Um, and then we have the Carignan uh, uh, from Bucignani that we made. Yeah, and that, there were some questions about, we had bottled some varietal Grenaches in the past. And yeah. the reason we really don't do that anymore is because when we decided to pursue making a, a blended Rhone wine, 
uh, putting the Grenache together with Syrah as well as Mataro, that, that kind of used up our Grenache. Plus, I think you always use a little bit of Grenache in the Lit and Springs wine as well, right, John? Um, no, most of it goes to the, uh, goes the to blue. the program. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. All right. So and it, to your rosé, right? You yeah, always have a little bit in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other, other, other use for the Grenache, which uh, we seem to always need more of as well. So the, the Grenache is pretty well spoken for, and that's why we, we discontinued making it as a standalone. But, but you got to re remember, uh, Mark, we also, we, we got a little project of a Grenache that we're coming back with in 19 vintage, a little 200 case production. I was trying to keep that a secret. No. Now, now <laughs> it's out there. So that's, that's all right. Ryan's, yeah. Ryan's already yeah. smiling. He likes these little, these little goodies that leak yeah, out no. during our <laughs> seminars. So yeah. So yeah, we're uh, there. There may those of you who like a varietal Grenache, there may be something for you coming out uh, in the near future. So we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, more more on that later. But that's good. Okay, so John, uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about the, uh, not only the Bucanyani Ranch Carignan, but why are you in your kitchen today? What are you doing for it? You're going to do something special for us there today. Yeah, so uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm coming to you from my uh, home in Healdsburg. And, uh, you know, with, with everybody uh, spending as much time at home as we are, and I know a lot of us are doing a lot more cooking than we have in the past, I thought it'd be a good idea to just do a quick demo of, uh, of a dish that I really like to make. It's one of my go-tos, especially as summer weather is, is starting to uh, uh, come upon us. And uh, it is a dish, it's ratatouille, so um, dish, uh, sort of quintessential Provençal dish. And, um, you know, it's, it's a, when you think of the Mediterranean diet, this is pretty much it. You know, you have olive oil uh, and, a, and a variety of vegetables. Uh, specifically, what we have here, we've got uh, sweet peppers, onions, zucchini, uh, eggplant, and then tomatoes. And when you're talking about, you know, Provencal food as, in, in general, uh, you know, most of it you can, you can just wash down with some rosé. You can never go wrong that way. But Sometimes, you know, you want to you, you want to reach for a red wine. And so when we were talking about the Carignan, that's what made me think of, of, of doing the Ratatouille with it. Because this is a, Carignan is a grape in general and specifically um, from the Bucagnani Ranch, which I think really, really marries well um, with a lot of these types of foods, whether it's pasta or in this case, Ratatouille. And basically, so what we have here is, is we're really just making a vegetable stew. Um, but what's important about making ratatouille is that unlike, a, for example, a lot of stews which are based in uh, meat, if you're making also buco, if you're making a pork shoulder, you can cook it for eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, very forgiving in that sense. Um, not the case with ratatouille. The timing is very important. And you don't really want to go too far. You want to cook the vegetables enough till they get really soft. They give all their essence, but they don't lose their form. Otherwise, you're, you're sort of making a, a you know a puree as opposed to a stew. So uh, what we'll do is um, uh, just start uh, getting the onions going. What I've done is I've cut the vegetables up uh, about halfway, and then we can just talk a little bit about the uh, um, the various uh, sizes and timing of it. But maybe to get started, we'll, we'll pour ourselves a, uh, a glass of the Bucagnani Carignan. And this is a ranch uh, which we first made back in 1999. And I remember, I can remember the day when Stan Bucagnani, who was a third generation uh, owner and farmer of the, uh, uh, of the ranch, came into the winery, said he had these grapes for sale. And I asked him what it was and he said, Carignan. And that, I, I spent a lot of time in the Languedoc uh, in France and, and Carignan was always a standout for me. Carignan is a grape which uh, throughout history has always been a blending grape. And it's a grape that frequently was used in, in sort of jug wines. It, it can be a very, very heavy yielding grape. Um, 
but in the ripe sites and also when the vines get old, it can, the yields reduce, it can make a beautiful, beautiful concentrated uh, wine without being heavy. And that's what's so, that's what's so uh, unique, I think, about Carignan is you have a, a grapes that are being grown in a very hot climate. Uh, this is Northern Sonoma County. And yet uh, you can, they ripen very slowly. They maintain their acidity, which is really key. And we get wines that are, are uh, despite the heat, are in the 13% realm. So uh, just great uh, with dishes like that, but also great in the summer. They're, they're wines you can even cool down, have them at cellar temperature, and they really fit a, a really nice spot. But let's get, we'll get the dish started right now. So um, of the ingredients, we want to start out with the onions because they take the longest to cook. And I just have them, cut them into thirds, cut them in thirds again. And if you look, you can see that, that we're, we're trying to keep everything cut in about the same uh, uh, size here. So we'll start by just getting our onions into the pot here. And then we'll add uh, a couple of pinches of salt, knowing that we can always come back and add a little more. And while that's going, we will, I've got peppers here. I had one red pepper, one yellow pepper. Uh, what I like to do is just hold the pepper over an open flame uh, briefly, just to blister the skin and get it off there. You don't have to but uh, it keeps the skins from uh, separating and just sort of floating all over the place when you're cooking it. So here we're just gonna core this one out. And then uh, notice that you, you wanna pour, a lot of people will discard this juice. The juice is actually some of the best part of it. That's where the pepper gets a lot of its sweetness. So I definitely like to hold on to that. And while the <clears throat> onions are going on here, they've started to sweat a little. We're gonna add the olive oil. Now we can turn up the flame a little. So while that's cooking, then we're just gonna slice our peppers into uh, the slices we want here, strips basically lengthwise and then once cut in half. And then when the, uh, while we're waiting for the onions to start um, browning, we can go ahead. I, I minced up the garlic here. This is about seven cloves of garlic. Um, you know, a lot of people think that's a lot. I think one of the important things, probably the key with garlic is, is really appreciating, um, there's a big, big difference between raw garlic and cooked garlic. We're gonna be putting this in early. It's gonna cook for a fairly long time. If I was making uh, aioli, for example, uh, where you're using raw garlic. For four or five people, I'd only use one clove of garlic uh, because it's that strong. But when you cook it, uh, you can use six, seven, eight, and you get all the flavor um, without it being overwhelming. So we've got the garlic in there cooking. And we'll go ahead and we're gonna add in the peppers. While we're watching John do this, I want to point out that the recipe uh, is available on our website for this ratatouille. So if you are getting hungry watching this and would like to prepare it for yourself, you can find that recipe on our website. Yeah, and we're uh, yep, and we'll we'll ask you to bear with us here because this was a this was sort of a, an impromptu idea and. Uh, 
so we're just trying to we're kind of trying to wing it from home with a with a camera so uh <laughs> if you like it let us know and then we'll uh we'll get the uh get some extra cameras out for the next time so uh we've got the peppers in at this point and uh the one thing that's not in season um but uh you can't find vine ripe and tomatoes right now. So I just got canned. The good news is, you know, one of the things I think that preserves um, as well as, as anything else is, uh, is tomatoes. You know, if you can make your own sauce, uh, store it for a year and it's, it's really nice and fresh. So we're gonna go ahead and toss in our tomatoes here. And then at the same time, we'll get the eggplant going. I can smell it from here, John. Can you? Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's too early. You can't smell it yet. So, and then I've got a, I've got a little bouquet garni here. This is just uh, uh, bay leaf and uh, parsley and thyme. Uh, I think thyme is probably the most critical herb uh, of all to use. It just, it really permeates everything and gives it that great kind of a minty uh, elevation to all the flavors. So we're gonna add a little more of the sauce here. Basically, we wanna just add enough that we're covering it because we're gonna put this to a nice slow simmer. Sometimes I'll add a little water just to get it up to level. So now we've got all the ingredients in except for the zucchini and the zucchini cooks much faster so we're going to turn this down a little bit and uh, we'll wait to put the zucchini in. And while we're doing that, we can, uh, we can taste a little bit of wine. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, like I was saying, you know, the Bucignani Vineyard, when I first saw it uh, back in 99, you could just tell from the look of the vineyard, uh, beautiful old vines. Uh, they're so healthy despite being 80, 85 years old. Uh, nice small berries. Uh, the berries almost look like Cabernet. They're just brown and little teeny, um, little teeny things. And uh, I remember going to Paul and saying, you know, Paul, we we've, we've got to try this. This stuff looks incredible. And uh, I, re I remember some of the <laughs> back then, some of the salespeople were saying, yeah, but I mean, who's going to be able to pronounce Carignan and Bucignani? But uh, I was like, you know what? They're going to learn. It's that good. So. Uh, uh, yeah, this is really the 18, um, for 20th, hard to believe it's our 20th, uh, 20th harvest. But really beautiful sort of focused blackberry fruit to it. Uh, again, more medium bodied, little lower alcohol and that terrific acidity, which uh, I think makes it such a great pairing, especially with this dish. Hey, David, maybe you can say a little bit more about uh, about the vineyard. I mean, it's really, it really is a unique site in terms of the yeah. soil. Yeah, it's, it, it actually drains to Alexander Valley. So it's in the Alexander Valley AVA, American Viticultural uh, Area. Um, Stan's ranch, Stan Bucignani's ranch, is the headwaters of uh, Dorelli Creek. So he's got this beautiful spring that comes out of the ground about 120 gallons a minute year round. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. His grandfather started planting, bought, bought the place and started planting uh, in the in the 1920s. So the oldest block is the front block of Carignan as you drive in and um, planted during the middle of prohibition. So uh, they, did, which makes sense because that's when they were doing a lot of packing out of grapes. And for the first few years of prohibition, vineyards did really very well. Um, then his, uh, Stan Bucignani's father and uncle started planting again in the, in a little bit in the 30s and then in the um, 40s and the very last grapes were planted in I believe the early 50s. So kind of generational planting. Um, there's some Zin there as well and throughout all the blocks there's some mixed whites, mostly um, uh, Columbard and Palomino a little bit of burger. And like um, 
like every good good Italian farmer, you'll find some table grapes up on top and <laughs> scattered around. So you have have something to eat while you're harvesting the rest of the wine grapes. Uh, the soil is is um is pretty. It, it's it's old soil. It's a it's an old riverbed. So the round rocks, uh, very oxidized, very red soil, and and like John was saying, beautiful vines. And you can tell that they've been well cared for. Um, from from multiple generations of the same family, much like the Pagani Ranch, um, where, and in fact, Dino Amantiti from Pagani Ranch uh, told us about this vineyard being for sale. For years, Stan had sold to uh, Gallo. His dad had always sold to Gallo. And um, if if everyone recalls in the, uh, or if you recall in the late 90s, Gallo was downsizing a little bit as far as buying fruit. They had a lot of their own vineyards coming in, for instance, the Borelli Creek property that they have is for almost is a neighbor of, Stan, part of it's a neighbor of Stan's and it's it's a vast vineyard. So they were um, kind of cutting back and so uh, their loss was our gain. And hmm. um, yeah, and Stan does a great job. He's still farming it himself and um, doing a great job. Cool, so now um, I think we can, we're gonna go ahead, we're doing this we're speeding up a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and put the zucchini in. <clears throat> Get that nice and buried into the sauce. Add just a little bit more tomato juice. And we'll turn up the flame to get it just up to a simmer. And then at that point, once we get to a simmer, we just turn it down and let it just barely bubble away for about about 40 minutes. But basically, it's just until um, everything there is nice and soft, but like I said, still has its form. And um, maybe we'll, we'll we'll move on and, and take a look at the the uh, <clears throat> 2014 Carignan because this. This is pretty special um, to really, you know, Carignan as a general rule, uh, like I said, it's either a blending grape. Uh, if you do see it as a standalone grape, it tends not to be, it's not a grape with a whole lot of tannin. It's not really a structured wine. So to see one that holds up this well for aging is really, it's really unique. I think a lot of it has to do, like I was saying, it's those berries, you know, the, the clusters are just tiny for, for Carignan, very low yielding, um, and very, very small berries. So you're getting a lot of skin, uh, high skin to juice uh, ratio there. And, uh, you know, this wine still, I, I think it's still very young. It could easily go another four or five years. And, uh, but you see the fruit kind of shifting, you know, getting away from that, that blackberry into things more like fig, olive. I think one of the reasons also the this wine ages uh, as well as it does is the 2014 uh, at the Bucanyani Ranch, it was a ripe year. Uh, so, I mean, this is 14, I think 14 and a half, which was the, the highest, uh, the, the ripest uh, Carignan we've ever made uh, from the, the ranch. They're usually low 13s, mid 13s uh, as far as alcohol. But I think it's really held up and has a little more concentration than um, uh, it typically would. Yeah, really a beautiful wine for uh, for a Carignan. That's uh, you know, that's a pretty rare treat to see a wine really hold up that well. So, John, tell us a little bit. You you spent some time in the south of France when you were younger. Is this where you got inspired for cooking the dish you're cooking here for us today? Um, yeah, I. I, I uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time in Provence. Uh, my uncle lived there for most of his life. And uh, he was very close friends with uh, the Tampiers from uh, from Bandol. So uh, Lulu uh, Tampier is a, a celebrated uh, uh, hostess and cook from the south of France. And uh, we would go there frequently and uh, have dishes like this. Uh, uh, Roasted leg of lamb on the spit, uh, aioli, uh, yeah, you know, mussels cooked right on some 
grapevine embers. Um, yeah, lots, lots of great memories of uh, spending time there and uh, eating a lot of good food and drinking a lot of good wine. In fact, one of the customers commented that this made them feel like they were back in Lulu's kitchen. So. Yep. Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I would. I would have just stayed, but I had to get a job eventually. So. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, any if you're if somebody was going to make this ratatouille for the first time, is there anything you would uh, like you know caution them or or a, a trick or a idea that they should have in mind when they're going to approach this dish for the first time? Well, um, you know, it's it's the you know cooking the, the 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 trifecta of cooking is salt water fat right so as long as you get those things uh perfectly aligned just like in wine making you know you have to have these acidity your ripeness um you should be okay so uh in fact that's actually a really good segue into uh what i did a little earlier is i already made the dish since we won't have time to sit here and wait for this one to cook all the way through. And probably the, the best secret that I could, could offer is that once you've cooked the, the dish through, uh, everything has released all of its juices into, uh, into the pot. And your vegetables are ready, to be are ready to eat. They're perfectly cooked, but you have a lot of extra liquid left over. So what I do is I take the... Uh, I take the whole pot, I pour it through a colander into a skillet, and uh, I have I have that from the last one that I did. So basically, what you're seeing here, you can see it, is this is all the juices which I already started to reduce, and if you can reduce that down, I mean all the way down to almost something like maple syrup, it's just a, uh, it, it changes the whole dish because it really, really concentrates all the flavor. And it's also, I think, a reason why the Bukunyan and Karanyan is so, so good with this dish is because you have a lot of sweetness coming out from the tomatoes, coming from the peppers. And when you have that acidity from the Karanyan, it really cuts through that sweetness and, and just makes it a perfect, perfect marriage. So here, yeah, this is almost, this is getting there, but in a second, so here's our final, this is the final dish from, uh, from earlier. And you can see we have uh, our, our peppers, you can still make them out here, our zucchini, eggplant. So everything's still intact. And then as this really gets down into a nice syrup, we just take it, and we can pour it right over the top, just like a gravy. And then all we have to do from that point is just grab some fresh basil, throw it on top. And uh, pour yourself and all your friends from Carignan, and um, you'll be you'll be in good shape. Fantastic! So wow. That's, that's uh, so. There's ratatouille in uh, you know in ten minutes <laughs> <laughs> with Carignan. So how long how long did you really uh, uh, cook the vegetables for, John? To about forty five about forty five minutes. Forty five minutes. So forty five minutes to an hour, depending on. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Good. And uh, is there anything else you would serve with that? Uh, well, you know, the neat thing about uh, ratatouille is, you know, which is one of the reasons that it's so great, even with a red wine like carrying on, is it's, it's a lot heartier than you might think. I mean, it, you can make a whole meal out of it. Mm -hmm. If you decide to have, for example, uh, in, in, you know, in the south of France, they'll have like some of their little rouge or some, some fish on the side, that sort of thing. Um, you can certainly do that. But, uh, you know, it'll stand alone on its own, have a little cheese afterwards, and uh, mm, perfect. take a fiesta, and you're, <laughs> you're in pretty good shape. Now that sounds great. Um, so on the, the, the Bucanyani Ranch Carignan, um, maybe you could just kind of 
finish off on the wine by uh, telling us in general, we've, we've, we've looked at this um, 14, but in terms of a window of drinking for the wine, what would you recommend for, you know, vintage plus how many years in, as far as drinking? Well, typically, typically, and I mean, if we were looking at the 18 or most vintages, I, w I would say, you know, right around the three to five year period, I think is, is when it's uh, really, uh, all the flavors have resolved. There's not that much tannin to resolve, but the flavors have really come together. Um, it's not a wine that we use a lot of oak on, so it doesn't really have that to resolve. I think the 14, on the other hand, is a wine which, uh, you know, now at more like six years is just kind of coming into its own. So this is a wine that's more in the six and, and even 10 year uh, range, but it's uh, probably a little, you know, has extended the range a little bit just because, like I said, it's a bigger vintage. Fantastic. We, we've got a couple questions from customers who wanted you to talk a little bit, maybe a little compare and contrast with a newer ranch that we've started working with, the Demosthenes Ranch, and, and the fact that there's, a, there's Carignan over there in that ranch, and maybe a little, a little compare and contrast on that Carignan versus the Bucagnani Carignan. Yeah, well, you know, we, 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 I think there's a lot of similarities in terms of the Carignan. Again, uh, pretty warm area. Uh, I think the soil is a little bit richer at uh, uh, Demosthene Ranch. So maybe there's a little more yield there, um, you know, but still great acidity, even, you know, lower ripeness. Um, I mean, you know, what we've done at the Demosthene Ranch, Demosthene sort of interesting because Typically, you either see a, a, a whole block of a grape or you see Carignan blended in and mixed field blend. Uh, at Demosthene, what they did is they, they took a block and, and essentially planted half of it to Carignan uh, and half of it to Zinfandel. So, and those two seem to ripen pretty closely. So we have been either harvesting them the same and co-fermenting them or they're coming in so close that we're able to co-ferment them. Um, but as we uh, continue to work with the ranch, I think we'll have an opportunity to uh, look at the Carignan on its own. And we actually, uh, David can tell you, we actually just um, uh, butted over a, a portion of their ranch, another portion of their ranch, two Carignans. So we're going to have more Carignan uh, fairly soon in the future to be working from that ranch. So one other, one other thing that uh, has come up in the questions is sort of talking about uh, the quality of Carignan as the vines age versus a younger, younger planting of Carignan. Any thoughts on that uh, topic? Well, I think uh, there's no question that uh, Carignan, um, if it is planted in fairly fertile soil and when it's young, it will produce uh, large clusters and pretty big fat berries. So, um, which is what, you know, was uh, sort of the standard in the Languedoc years ago. But again, if you get up on the hillside where the Bucagnani Ranch is, much, much poorer soils, soil. And as the vines, as the metabolism of the vine slows down and it produces smaller clusters, um, it really can tip the whole scale to the other side where you get this, you know, really beautiful expression. Um, of Karen. Fantastic. Well, I think we've, uh, we've just about used up our time for the day today. Uh, again, thank John, thank you so much for uh, taking the risk to do a live cooking demonstration <laughs> with, <laughs> with, with no, pra no we rehearsal. Made it, we made it alive. <laughs> yeah, the kitchen's not burnt down and, uh, you know, it looks fantastic. I'm, I'm tempted to head over to your house right after this thing to have a taste of that because it looks so good. Um, I think uh, I want to thank the panelists for uh, for sharing their thoughts about the wines today, and also note that uh, we will be right. doing another seminar next week. A special treat next week: we're going to be taking a look at some older Montebellos. So, for those of you who uh, really enjoy a well-aged Montebello, that's going to be the topic of the seminar and the tasting. Uh, for next week. And uh, again, uh, I think we have a few, a few of those bottles available for sale as well. If you want to purchase them uh, before the tasting, I would encourage you to do that. Um, and uh, with that, I think we're going to say uh, bon appetit and salute. <laughs> and, uh, we'll see everyone again next week uh, 
uh, on Thursday at four o'clock. Thank you very much. Nice job, John. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>